Hello everybody, I'm Raphael Perry, and it's time once again for another dive into the Fighting Fantasy Classics collection. Now, some time ago, I believe it was about two months, maybe three months ago, a viewer of one of my previous Fighting Fantasy videos asked if I would do a playthrough of House of Hell. And I responded that I'd absolutely love to, but there were a few things I wanted to get out of the way first, and that I would soon be beginning a playthrough of Way of the Tiger, and I might be able to manage recording the beginning of House of Hell before I started on Way of the Tiger. Unfortunately, as it just so turns out, Tin Man Games have put out two versions of House of Hell. And I spent the two or three days prior to beginning to record Way of the Tiger trying to decide which version of House of Hell I should record. Essentially, the two versions are very similar. So there's a standalone version, and there's the one that is presented here in the Fighting Fantasy Classics collection. The major difference between the two is the quality of the in-game map. I believe the standalone version has a significantly better map in that it actually maps out the mansion as it is explored, whereas the one presented here represents... Uh, it maps out decisions made, more like a sort of flowchart or spider diagram. And I wasn't sure which one I wanted to go for. So I've actually done a, a quick test recording of a few minutes of each and compared them. And while I couldn't remember or easily check which one has the better map without playing quite a bit and then checking the map for each version, it did turn out that the standalone version didn't record as well in that it recorded in a weird squished aspect ratio that looked kind of stretched vertically and squashed in at the sides or something. So I'm probably recording this one. However, in the interest of comparing maps, if the map in this version is not very useful, I might cut in a few sections from the other one. So I might actually have to play through the other version, copying my playthrough here to get to the same sections and build the same maps. Now, when it comes to House of Hell, the reason I am so concerned about the map is that it is one of the fighting fantasy game books that has been... Well, it's got a reputation for being notoriously difficult. Not necessarily because combat encounters are particularly hard, but because a lot of players had difficulty finding their way around the house itself. Now, the mansion is relatively large, it's got a not insignificant amount of rooms, and there is, you know, reasonable amount of availability for backtracking as well at various points, so it would be reasonably easy to get lost if players weren't visualizing the layout of the place too well. And uh, so I was I was sitting down thinking, should I should I go and find a, a map online? Because if this is actually one of the Fighting Fantasy game books which <coughs> is so difficult to navigate that some, not only one, but there are two or three different versions, I believe, of maps of the House of Hell online that players have uploaded to make things easier for everyone else. However, while I could have downloaded one of those and looked at it to help navigate my way around the house, there are things written in, in rooms, like, you know, this is the room with the wardrobe, or this is the room with the old woman, or something like that. And the problem is that, as I have played this book significantly in the past, it might remind me of things. And I might go, oh yeah, I don't want to go in that room, or oh, I need to go there, actually. You know. And that's not necessarily the best. I, I don't want to spoil the playthrough, you know? So, let's begin. Oh, okay. We get the back cover as well, wow. Now, this book is somewhat unusual. Do we... I'm checking quickly for... Uh, the bit at the back, come on. 
because this updated version has... Ah, I will find it, don't worry, even if I have to boot up the other version. Um, right, options... No... No, no, no... Okay, so we have just dive in. See, there is an extra section at the back of the book. Um, alright, I'm going to actually swap over to the other one and pull it up because there's a nice little bit in the back by Steve Jackson about the original inspiration for the adventure and the book itself. But before I do that, let's have a little talk. So this is, as far as I'm aware, the only fighting fantasy book to ever have one of its illustrations censored after the initial print run. Yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a picture somewhere in here of a bunch of devil cultists sacrificing a young girl. I think she's a district nurse, I can't remember. And for whatever reason, you know, the people at the time, like Mary Whitehouse and all the people who go, ooh, no, 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 you can't have that, got very concerned about the body of a naked person on a sacrificial altar sac surrounded by evil cultists about to kill the person. And they thought, oh no, we can't have that. You know, pe people might think it's something sexy. And I'll tell you what, right? When I was like 10 or 11 years old and I got hold of this book, I didn't look at that picture and think, ooh, that lady's got no clothes on. I feel really excited and my willy feels silly. No, I thought, bloody hell, that girl's going to be sacrifice both of those evil cultists. I've got to go save her, right? So I didn't even notice if there might have been like a bit of an ankle showing or something or an elbow, you know. But no, it was it was deemed to be a little bit too raunchy. And so the illustration was actually redrawn and there's either like a few candles strategically placed to cover a nipple or something or um or one of the cultists is standing in a slightly different position, but essentially there's a little bit less naked victim on display than there originally was, and it's not much of a difference. And the original unedited picture was rather tame by modern standards when you see what gets thrown in our faces in adverts and so-called non-pornographic films these days. Or internet pop-ups. But yeah, um, I don't know which version of the illustration is available in this adventure. I don't even know if I'll get to that section. But that does make this book rather unique. It's also the only fighting fantasy book to have been taken away and destroyed by my parents, or disposed of, because they didn't like the, the devil worshippers and the evil cult that lurk in the mansion. I was able to pick up a copy later on when I was much older, and you know what? It's all right as an adventure goes, right? It's a, it's a horror. It's a, <laughs> the, the video nasty of game books from the 1980s, as it were. Now, let's go swap over to the other version of this book that's available to play and see if I can find the bit at the back. Ah, yes. Here we are. The other version. Uh, yeah, funnily enough, actually, a few weeks ago, this version of House of Hell disappeared from my Steam library for about three or four days, and I was looking, trying to work out, one of my games is missing. The number has been reduced by one. I can't work out what's missing. It took me a long time. And then, I was... When it came back, I was like, oh, that's what went missing. Why did it go away and why did it come back? I honestly don't know. So it was clearly spirited away for a while. Anyway, extras. The story of House of Hell. Because I feel this is worth sharing, right? And this is by Steve Jackson himself. 
So what better way than to hear the man's own words? What can I remember about House of Hell? It was a long time ago, but here's some backstory for you. I think my love affair with horror began at the age of about seven when I read a Classics Illustrated comic of the Frankenstein story. Desperately needing to visit the toilet, I simply could not go upstairs into the darkness. My father had to come up with me to fend off any bolt-necked monsters which might be lurking up there. Also, as a young boy, I can remember my father's friend held me spellbound as he described the story of one of, of the Boris Karloff mummy films. He related in great detail how one of the slaves had his tongue cut out so he could never tell anyone where the mummy was buried. I can imagine now how amateurish that tongue ectomy must have been in pre-CGI days, but to a ten-year-old with a vivid imagination, this vision was enduring and truly horrifying. That image stuck, and I've had a fascination for horror movies ever since. Halfway between Manchester's Piccadilly and Oxford Road dis stations, I discovered a magazine import shop. It was a grubby place owned by a film enthusiast, and it was there that I discovered a US magazine called Famous Monsters of Filmland. Every month I'd make the pilgrimage into Manchester to get the latest issue packed full of reviews, photos and plot synopses. But as a young teenager living in Altrincham, Cheshire, I longed for a day when I could go and watch a real adult horror movie, but these films were a 16 certificate. At the age of 13, I persuaded three of my school chums to come with me to try and get into the old Trinchim picture house, where the curse of the mummy's tomb was showing. However, this attempt turned out to be a disaster. The youngest of the four, who barely looked his genuine age, was refused entry. I piped up for him and was dismissed too, but the others, who looked older, managed to get in without question. I had to wait for school the next morning to hear the story. Finally, at the age of 14, I did get to see a horror film firsthand. This was a Hammer film, Dr. Terror's House of Horrors, a collection of short stories involving passengers on a train. Their futures were related one by one by Peter Cushing, playing a mysterious voyager with a tarot deck. The stories involved voodoo, werewolves, living plants, vampires, and my favourite, a severed hand. Each passenger was apparently going to come to a grisly death. When I got home from the cinema, I wrote the story out in full detail in an exercise book, and I still have it somewhere. That severed hand story had an influence on House of Hell. There was a couple of scenes where Christopher Lee was driving along the road in the middle of the night in the pouring rain. He could hardly see the road ahead. Suddenly, the hand appeared, forcing him to swerve off the road, just like the start of the House of Hell, bar the hand and with no mysterious mansion nearby. So where did that all come from? Another memorable horror influence around the same time was the filming by Hammer of Dennis, Dennis Wheatley's satanic classic, The Devil Rides Out. This story, and To the Devil a Daughter, were very influential, as were the various Hammer horror films of the 60s and 70s, many of which involved cultism, satanism, and black magic. When Fighting Fantasy first appeared and became quite successful, Ian and I developed slightly different approaches in how we wanted to extend the series. Ian wanted to build up the myths and legends of Alancia with consistent characters and locations, the fact that Alancia has a consistent world is largely down to his work. I, on the other hand, wanted to see what could be done with the system. New rules, locations, eras, etc. Warlock magazine had started publishing mini-adventures and it was my turn to do one. I had already written a magic-based fantasy adventure, Citadel of Chaos, a science fiction adventure, Starship Traveller, an epic fantasy adventure, Sorcery. What to do next? My teenage love of horror was an obvious one. An original rule. Why, to avoid being scared to death, of course. The short version appeared in Warlock. The full version appeared in 1985. From what I hear from readers, they found it was a tough one. Good. 
finally, I can't sign off without giving due praise to both Ian Miller, whose creepy scene of the entrance to the House of Druma was dark, spooky, and scary. Perfect. Also to Tim Sell, whose brilliant black and white illustrations bring the adventure to life. Signed, Steve Jackson, January 2013. I wanted to share that. And, um... When the game reappeared, bizarrely, um, it blanked the art gallery for me, so I have to go find all the pictures again at some point. It didn't blank the achievements, just blanked the art gallery. Disappeared for like half a week, all the pictures I'd found, forgotten, and then it came back! Alright, let's cut across back to the new version now, and begin playing. And now we're back, in Fighting Fantasy Classics Collection territory. Let's delve in to the House of Hell. Oh yeah. Yeah, no bookmarks, just starting. Treat it as a brand new playthrough. Awesome. And of course, as usual, I will read out the rules for those of you not entirely familiar with how Fighting Fantasy plays. And for those of you who are, it's an opportunity for nostalgia. House of Hell is a Fighting Fantasy game book, an interactive adventure in which you are the hero. You can only win by choosing the correct path, finding equipment, avoiding traps, and surviving combat. House of Hell is a little different from other fighting fantasy adventures. You start your adventure unarmed, with no provisions or potions, and you have to avoid being frightened to death! Before starting House of Hell, you must choose from one of three difficulty settings. This gamebook has been designed for optimum challenge on hardcore and adventurer difficulty modes. For newcomers to Fighting Fantasy, we recommend adventurer or free read modes. Hardcore Hero Hardcore Hero Play House of Hell exactly how Steve Jackson designed it. Nothing has been changed from a printed version. Your starting skill is calculated by rolling 1d6 plus 6 with a minus 3 modifier added at the beginning of the adventure due to being unarmed. Your starting stamina is calculated by rolling 2d6 plus 12 and your starting luck is calculated by rolling 1d6 plus 6. So, tr the true way for fighting fantasy stats to be created. You also have a maximum fear value which is calculated by rolling 1d6 plus 6. There are unlimited bookmarks for you too, which act like placing your fingers between the pages. Adventurer! Play House of Hell with a little help. Your starting stamina is calculated by rolling 2d6 plus 24. That's a whole extra 12 stamina. And your maximum fear value is calculated by rolling 1d6 plus 9. There is no skill penalty at the beginning of the adventure. As with Hardcore Hero, you are also given unlimited bookmarks. And then we have Free Read. Play House of Hell like an old school cheater. Using the same initial skill, stamina and luck, and maximum fear as Hardcore Mode, Free Read gives you free options to easily negotiate your way through the book. The Rewind Button. You can move backwards to the previous page. Should you take the wrong direction, you can now back up and choose another path. The free choice button. You can unlock all links on any page, irrespective of whether they are available, so you can easily negotiate tricky parts of the story, even if you do not possess the required conditions or items. Be warned, navigating the story in this way can sometimes result in odd story outcomes. And then there is the Heal button. You are able to fully heal yourself at any time, so you will never run out of stamina. Which difficulty do you choose? Hardcore Hero Mode, absolutely. The original, the best. And we get the picture of the voodoo doll. Full of pins and needles and... That might be a bone or the end of a scroll rolling out from underneath it. Yeah. You have chosen Hardcore Mode. Before embarking on your adventure, you must first determine your own strengths and weaknesses. 
To see how brave, lucky and resourceful you are, you must use dice to determine your initial skill, stamina and luck scores. Your skill score reflects your general fighting expertise. The higher, the better. Your starting skill is determined by rolling a single die and adding six to that number. Well, let's do it then! You begin House of Hell with no weapon, so you start off the adventure with three deducted from your initial skill. What have we got? That was such a six and then it just rolled over onto a one! Okay, we are rubbish at fighting. we got to be careful about that. Next, determine your stamina. Your stamina score reflects your general constitution and your will to survive, your determination and courage. The higher your stamina score, the longer you will be able to survive. Your starting stamina is determined by rolling two dice and adding 12 to that number. So, we got a low skill score, okay? It is what it is. Um, House of Hell isn't one of the game books with notoriously difficult combats, like The Return of Zagor, um, Legend of the Shadow Warriors, the, the, the Chaos Warriors one, what was it, uh, Knights of Chaos or something, I can't remember what it was called, it was up in the 50s, just before for one of the mummies, so it was like 53 or something. That book, you couldn't get through unless your skill was at least 11 or 12, because there were, like, skill 16 opponents in some places, you know, it was just outrageously mental. Um, so this one, the fights aren't the hardest, but there are lots of other things. There's auto kills and then there's the fear system, which is an extra way to get us. So the fights don't need to be that hard on top of everything else. Oh my goodness! Alright, we're playing a cripple. And now for your luck, we'd better get higher than a 2, is all I'm saying. Your luck score indicates how naturally lucky a person you are. Luck and evil are facts of life in the devilish domain you are about to explore. Your starting luck is determined by rolling one die and adding six to that number. If this is a one- oh my god. Right. Yeah, we, we are a victim apparently. In addition to ensuring your stamina never drops to zero, order to, in order to survive your adventure in House of Hell, you must also avoid being frightened to death. Roll one die and add six to determine your fear. This total will give you the maximum fear score that you can bear. Your fear score is the number of points you can take before being frightened to death. So, having the fear mechanic adds an extra level of danger and difficulty to the adventure, right? It means that, you know, you can fail skill checks, you can fail luck checks, you can die from stamina loss, or you can also die from fear. So it's an... Ah! So, we're playing a character with low skill, low luck, moderately low health. Okay, we're basically... If we had a lot more health, I'd say we're playing Ash from the Army of Darkness series. Um, but we're playing more like Todd and the Book of Pure Evil at this rate, aren't we? And that's a whole separate... Oof, you know. At least we got a good fear score. Good luck. You'll need it. And we're in. The rain spatters the windscreen relentlessly. You can see no more than a watery gloom as you strain forwards over the steering wheel to see the road ahead. Although the wipers flap valiantly, they are fighting a losing battle as the rain drives harder and harder. Your foot eases off the accelerator and the headlights struggle to light up the road. Oh, that reminds me, I do believe that recent reprints of this book have included a brief mention of the area around the house having no mobile phone coverage. So, for all those players who are like, well, why don't I just get out my mobile phone and, and ring for help instead of going into the house and asking if they've got a phone I can borrow to get a mechanic to come out and help the car. Yeah, but the book has essentially been updated in that sense, but... Pretty much only that sense. Damn! You curse the white-haired old man who sent you off along this bumpy track. I'm sorry, I'll read that one again. Damn! You curse the white-haired old man who sent you off along this bumpy track. Probably he meant the second turning on the left, or even a right turning. The old fool. And I will turn to check I'm recording, which I am, so that's all good. 
Perhaps this is his idea of a joke. After all, didn't you notice a mischievous glint in his eye? Something vaguely sinister? But what sort of nonsense is this? So you've taken a wrong turn and got caught in a downpour in the night. The rain will ease off soon. It can't possibly keep up this deluge for long. And then you'll be able to... WATCH OUT! You spin the wheel frantically to the left to avoid the figure who from nowhere shows up in the headlights. The car bumps and jolts as it bounces over the rocky roadside and thumps into a ditch. You collect your thoughts. You are unhurt but shaken. Then you remember what has happened. The body. You must have hit the figure that appeared. There was no way you could have avoided it. You spring out of the car, praying that he is still alive. Your clothes soak up the rain as you hobble back to the road. In the darkness, it is difficult to see anything, but there is no sign of a body. You consider the situation. Are you certain that it was someone and not a trick of the light? Yes, you, you can remember the arms held up in fright as the car collided and the look of anguish on his face. His face! There was something familiar about that face. A man you recognized. An old man with white hair. Your heart leaps. No, impossible. With a shiver of fear, you race back to the car, jump inside, force the key into the ignition and twist it violently. The starter coughs, sputters, and dies. You hit the key again, but this time a single shudder is all the engine can manage. You grasp the wheel as your ha in your with your with your hands. You grasp the wheel with your hands and shake it desperately as if to force some life into the car. But the battery is dead. Your car is certainly not budging from the ditch tonight. Your situation is hopeless, but now the plight of your car is paramount. Where can you get help? You passed a garage at Mingleford, but that is some 20 miles away. As if in answer, a light appears in the distance. Someone has switched on a bedroom light. What a stroke of luck! It was at least 15 miles back that you passed the last house and you happened to have broken down just a short distance from someone's home. You button up your coat and open the door. From inside the car you can see the building more clearly. Just ahead, on the left, a drive winds up to a large house. It is a good five minutes walk away, and by the time you reach it, you will be drenched. But how else can you call the garage? You can't afford to miss tomorrow's appointment. Now go, you must. Anyway, you'll probably be able to dry off. And inside, phone in the garage. You slam the door, turn up your collar, and set off for the house. A flash of lightning lights its way, lights it up clearly for you. But in your preoccupation with the rain, the warning from above is wasted on you. The house is old. Very old. And in a shocking state of repair. The light in the window is flickering. Most likely an oil lamp, certainly not electric. And you don't notice a fact that might have turned you back anywhere. There is no telephone line going to the house. As you climb the steps to the front door, little do you realize what fate has in store for you. Tonight is going to be a night to remember. It certainly is. And now, we turn over. Look at that picture. The rain is pelting down. The sky is full of clouds. And yes, I do like the old classic look of the illustrations on the weathered paper rather than the clean pages of the coloured versions. Also, we should now have... Yes, we do. Adventure Sheet. Uh, I haven't renamed our character, but... Wow, skill currently four due to having no weapon. Um, I wanted to have a little talk about the fear points, our 11 fear total here we can have. So, in addition to being an extra way to kill the character, the fear points are also a risk and reward strategy right? While searching around the house looking for clues, items, or vital pieces of information, you can gain fear points for exploring. 
If you don't have very many fear points, you can't afford to go exploring and looking very much. So, while the initial mechanic is an idea to avoid being scared to death, it's also a way of saying, this is how much you can push your luck. How much you can risk exploring. Because a fully successful playthrough of the game with no wrong turns at all would require... I don't know, but you probably get a few fear points throughout of that. I don't think it's possible to play through the entire thing without gaining at least three or four points of fear, right? So then you have to say, what other things can you explore? What encounters can you bump into, right? What risks are you going to take? You know, it's like, oh, if I check here, will there be fear points? Quite possibly. Will there be things I need? I don't know. So, in another way, the fear points allow you to play through exploring every option possible. Right? And any wrong options that yield nothing particularly useful, but give you fear points, are ones that you might remember not to take on a future playthrough. So, for an experienced player who's played the book recently, they might look at their fear roll and go, okay, that's roughly how many fear points I can risk. So there we are. You climb the creaking steps up to the front door and pause to catch your breath. Even though you ran all the way up the drive from the car, you are soaked through. Your feet are particularly wet. Judging by the number of puddles you've stepped into in the dark, the drive needs a small fortune spending on repairs, but under the porch you are out of the storm, and you brush the rain from your clothes before turning towards the door. The rain is still pelting down, but an eerie silence hangs in the air. I didn't notice it so pelting down there when I was referring to the picture, sorry. No lights are on upstairs, which means the light that was on is now out. Perhaps it was only illuminated as bait to lure me in. You step back off the porch to check the upstairs window which attracted your attention earlier. Nothing. No lights. The whole place seems to be deserted. But then you remember the time. Five minutes to midnight. Almost like the doomsday clock. Everyone in the house has probably gone to bed. An owl hoots in the distance and a shiver runs down your spine. The situation is a little scary. Here you are, in the middle of nowhere, at some strange, run-down old house, about to wake up whoever lives inside at midnight. They certainly won't be too pleased, but you have no choice if you're going to make your appointment tomorrow. You must reach a telephone to call for help. You step up to the front door. From the left-hand side of the house, a dull glow catches your attention. A light has been turned on. You breathe a sigh of relief. At least someone is awake. Yes, they probably turned off the light upstairs when they came downstairs. You know, I mean... I well, Sorry, I, I am not used to leaving lights on in every room in the house, right? When I was brought up, we were poor and we were taught you know, if there's no one else in the room and you go out of the room, you turn the light off to save on the electricity bills, right? And we did, because we knew our family was poor. And if this is an old house, then I imagine its occupants, wealthy or otherwise, may have a similar outlook. You consider your options. There is an elaborate knocker hanging in the middle of the door and a bell pull hanging down to the right. We can wrap up the knocker, pull the cord, or creep around the house to investigate the light. I believe the light is the kitchen window. We get to see a few people talking to each other. See, this is memory, right? This is the kind of memory I'm trying to avoid spoiling the playthrough. And that's the thing. I mean, what kind of playthrough do you guys want? Do you want like a perfect playthrough with no mistakes? I mean, Probably not with these stats, am I right? <laughs> but, uh, 
you know, I can be careful, I can be cautious. Do you want to see all the auto kills, all the wrong turns, all the dreadful errors that could lead to a hero's demise? I don't know. But I'm just going to play and have fun. And I've got to think, right. Knocking on the door and, w and pulling the bell cord and waiting. It might take some time. Sneaking around the side of the house could give us additional information, but at the cost of a few points of fear. We do have a lot of fear, though, that we can accept, so let's risk it. You walk from the porch round the side of the house. A light is indeed on, and it's shining through a window at the back of the building. Do you wish to go round to see if you can see anything through this window, or walk round to the front? Yes, we'll go. Look, we, we've gone, come so far, we're not just going to turn back. I mean, yeah, they might think we're trying to break in, but we can turn a, like, wave and say, Hello, excuse me, I need help. And there we have a scene. The rain still thrashes past the window. Look, it's going practically diagonally. And there I'm, I'm seeing part of a loaf of bread. On a now that's interesting. Look at the size of that, because um, we got pans. This is clearly a kitchen situation or a pantry, right? This loaf of bread has recently been the the board, the chopping board it's on. This looks like about two thirds of a loaf of bread, but if that is the case, it could barely fit on the chopping board when full size. So maybe it was a shorter loaf that has only recently been started. And more importantly, the slice that has been, or slices that have been cut, appear to have been disappeared. You know, taken away. Maybe they're in a toaster. Perhaps they've been eaten. And whoever's popped down for a midnight snack has not yet gone back upstairs. Also, while there's a big knife here with a very odd chunky handle, there's also two smaller spreading knives here and I'm not a bowl, uh, some kind of is that a sausage or a bucket handle? It seems to have a handle coming out of it. So maybe this is like a ladle. There's a, a cup and a teapot. So a bowl of like sugar or honey with a spoon handle coming out of that. And then there's just this thing, which is not a saucer. I don't know what that is. The lit window is next to a back door, which leads into the kitchen. Voices are coming from the kitchen, but you cannot see anyone. Whoever is in there must be standing by the back wall, out of sight. You strain to hear what is being said. There appear to be two people in the kitchen, and they are talking excitedly. Master is getting ready. I'm starting to get excited. I've never been to one before. Do you really think we may be visited? Another man's voice, rather more controlled, replies, you know, I'm having doubts about this whole affair. She is young, and she came here in all innocence. I just don't know. The two men walk around the kitchen, and you can see them more clearly. They are both dressed in white gowns. One is a good deal younger than the other. We could knock on the door and see whether they'll let us in. Maybe they're doctors, but the word innocence. Let's not. We'll wait and listen for a little longer. The white gowns have us intrigued, and we're like... Oh, that's unusual. The younger man turns to the older one and angrily says, The master's teachings are not for the faint-hearted. You know of his power and his promises to us all. Perhaps you are no longer strong enough to stay with us. The older man turns away towards the window. He is hiding the look on his face, which is one of nervousness and fear. He realizes that he has said the wrong thing. No, he stammers. I'll, I'll, I'll be all right. Just, just a momentary weakness. Come, let us get on with the preparations. Together, the two men leave the kitchen, blowing out the candles on the way. You wonder what they were talking about. Now you must choose your next move. We can try the kitchen door, or go back round to the front. I think I'll go back to the front. But I think we picked up some very important information there. A few moments later, the door handle turns slowly and the door opens. Standing in the doorway is a tall man dressed in a dark suit with tails. His long face is solemn. Yes, 
he asked indignantly. Oh, sorry, we were. Yes, he asked indignantly. You smile nervously and explain your situation. Your car has broken down. You need to reach a telephone and you are soaked to the skin. The man's face remains expressionless. Come in, he orders. The master is expecting you. Follow me. He leads you into reception hall and tells you to sit down while he informs his master of your arrival. You sit down in a solid carved chair and look around. The reception hall is certainly not what you would have expected from the outside. It is elegantly decorated with rich tapestries and fine oak panels. A number of portraits line the walls. A sturdy 16th century table is set against one wall. We can wait for our host to arrive, study the paintings, or hunt for a telephone. I'll look at the paintings and see what kind of people would live in a house like this. Yeah, I can't do a Lloyd Grossman impression to save my life. I know, it's fine. He always just sounded American to us, but it turned out really he was just kind of posh and snobby a bit. Right. Paintings. Three portraits are particularly interesting. Will you look at a beautiful young woman wearing a tiara? Or will you look at a middle-aged portly gentleman wearing half-moon glasses? Or alternatively, will you look at an elderly woman with grey hair and a cold expression? Right. So, at least one of these is a trap, right? We have the young woman, who might have won a beauty pageant or something. I sense that she looks too pretty and attractive, and something nasty will happen to her if we look. The middle-aged portly gentleman wearing half-moon glasses. The glasses indicate that he's short-sighted and does a lot of reading, so he will use the glasses for looking at things far away, then peer over them at something that he's reading. Uh, basically, a scholarly gentleman. He may also be a trap. An elderly woman with grey hair and a cold expression. Um, she doesn't look like a very kind, caring individual. Which means that while she might have helpful information, she, with a cold expression, she might not be likely to give it. And I, I'm aware these are portraits, right? But I'm pretty sure this is a horror game, right? So something's going to happen when I look at the portraits. Hmm. Let's look at the portrait of the old woman. Why not? Oh, yeah, look at that. There's an old woman with a... I wouldn't quite say a cold expression, but definitely elderly. You stare up at a portrait of the Duchess of Brewster, 1777 to 1845. She looks a stern old woman with an icy stare. A lady of nobility, no mistake. But as you stare, her image seems to shimmer. You blink and try to look away, but you cannot. Within the shimmering face, you see small movements and your jaw drops as the portrait's eyes turn towards you. You gain one fear point from the fright. The woman's lips start to move and you hear a voice saying, Stranger, you have innocently stumbled into a cursed place. Would that I could bid you escape, but alas, you cannot. There is evil and suffering within these walls, and you may only escape by destroying it. But that is almost impossible. I can tell you this, though. You have an ally close by who may be able to help. This man is dressed in a grey robe. If you can find him, you may together free this house from the evil that controls it. With these words, the shimmering stops. You rub your eyes and look again. The painting is still. Knowledge. Nope. Can I pull it up? Yes. 
There are men in white grounds and gowns in the house. I have an ally dressed in a grey robe. Male. Alright. Footsteps. Someone is coming. A tall man, the tall man you met earlier, walks in, opening the door for another tall man dressed in a red smoking jacket. May I present Lord Kellner, the Earl of Drumur, the butler announces. Now as a child, I always read that as drummer, even though I knew there was only one M. As it was like, like drummer. I mean, like, you know, how do you say Alan or Adam or Alice? You know, it's a name, right? Drummer does have that slightly more aristocratic ring to it, though. The Earl holds out his hand and you shake it. His grip is strong and his eyes pierce yours. His lips widen to a soft smile. You begin to tell him of your predicament, but he holds up his hand. Please, I can see that you have been caught in this filthy storm. Let us sit by the fire and we will see whether we can help F Franklin's. Tell the cook to prepare some food for our visitor. You protest that you do not wish to be any trouble, but your host ignores you and leads you to a drawing room where the fire is burning. You take off your coat and sit down. The heat of the fire makes you feel comfortable once more. Franklin returns with two glasses of brandy. Will you relax, drink the brandy and ask if you can use the telephone, or will you wait and see what he asks you? I'll wait, right? These people are rich. They have the luxury of knowing the right way to do things. They have enough time. They can call upon people to do things if they need to, right? Look at these two individuals. He's got a very thin lower face. He's definitely aging. He also looks a little bit like a cross between Leonard Nimoy and Tom Baker. <laughs> now there's a thought. Whereas the butler looks somewhat less recognisable. Um... You know, I feel that I should ask to use the telephone in the current circumstances. The appointment I need to make tomorrow is rather urgent indeed. The fire and brandy warm you and you begin to feel more relaxed. You lose one fear point. I'd completely forgotten that you could lose fear points in this adventure. This might be the only time it ever happens. You explain to the Earl what happened on the road and that you would like to use his telephone to call the local garage. I'm afraid our telephone line came down tonight in the storm, he replies. We will have it repaired tomorrow morning. In any case, the garage would not come out here at this hour. But don't worry. You are perfectly welcome to spend the night here. I am glad of the company. Tomorrow, Franklin's will take you into town. Ah, here is Franklin's now. The butler comes back in to announce that a meal is ready. You both rise to go into the dining room. The dining room looks magnificent. A long table stretches between two fine chairs and is laid with gleaming silver cutlery. A rich red wallpaper covers the walls and the room is lit by a sparkling chandelier bristling with candles which hangs from the ceiling. You take your seat and the butler moves behind you to offer you wine. Which wine would you like to drink? Uh, the white wine or the red? I don't drink wine. Uh, the few times I've tasted wine, I couldn't stand the taste of it, to be honest, so I just don't drink it. Um, right, this is a horror game. Drinking the red wine is obviously going to be like drinking blood. It probably won't be blood. The white wine, however, ooh, I, see, my memory tells me that one of the wines is drugged, and me, the person who doesn't drink wine, has no idea which wine would be better at concealing the flavour of some kind of drug. We're in a red room, right? The, the walls are red, 
Um, there's there's lots of things in this. You know, the the, the Lord is wearing a red smoking jacket. It's all pointing towards red. So there's a lot of subtle suggestion. You know, we've had the red smoking jacket in the last section. We've had the rich red wallpaper. Um, which means I probably shouldn't take the red, right? I'm sure that his lordship, the Earl, will choose the same as I do. I will go for the white wine. The wine is dry and light, obviously a very expensive vintage, but there is a puzzling aftertaste you can, which you cannot place. Oh dear, I've cocked it up. Perhaps there is a little sediment in the decanter. No, the taste is more like aspirin. Too late, you realise your wine has been drugged. You start to raise yourself from the table, but the effects are already taking hold. You stumble, fall back and crash to the floor. Consciousness fades. Oh, we have screwed up. You open your eyes. Your head is spinning and it is some time before you are fully aware of the fact that your hands and feet are bound. The room you are in is empty, but you work out a plan. You hop over to the window, break the glass and use it to cut yourself free. Pulling yourself to your feet is awkward, but you manage it and with a mixture of hops and shuffles you arrive at the window. Outside, the wind is blowing the rain against the window panes. Will you go ahead and smash the window of your hands? Something of a risky business, or will you instead test your luck? Uh, is there a smash window? No, there isn't. If you want to test your luck and smash the window of your hands, yeah, if you do not wish to use your luck here. Um, I think this is a good time to end the episode. Uh, We've not had the greatest beginning to our adventure. In fact, we've we've missed out on lots of potentially useful information. If we perish due to our mediocre stats, I'll obviously enjoy the opportunity to play again. But for now, I'm going to wish you all a lovely goodbye. I hope you all enjoyed this episode, and I will look forward to seeing you all in the next one. I'll say bye-bye for now, and cheerio!